Final Fantasy X is the Huddle House of the Final Fantasy series. Do you not know what that is? It's sort of like a Waffle House, but maybe better than that. If you don't know what a Waffle House is, it's like if Final Fantasy X had a sequel, and that sequel was a restaurant that could give you severe diarrhea. Final Fantasy X II, then, is a Waffle House. And Final Fantasy X itself is like that, but your food wasn't made by a sexual pervert otaku. Oh. Then again, Waffle House doesn't overtly make you play Blitzball. It just has a Grand Slam, which is sort of like Blitzball, but it gives you diarrhea. Blitzball can also give you diarrhea, but you can't eat it. Yet. Blitzball was released 20 years ago. It was packaged in a game called Final Fantasy X. 20 years ago. That's enough time for you, my 30 to 40 year old demographic viewer who's pathetically watching videos about a 20 year old game, to believe a Final Fantasy made 20 years ago would be in sprite form, only to now, at this moment, realize how detached from the world you have really become. Enough time for many generations of feral cats to be born and to die. That's not really a good metric of time, it's just technically true. In that time frame, the US thought about sending someone to the moon again, but didn't. Also, no one landed on Mars. No planets were discovered. We lost a planet. Nothing happened in the past 20 years, right? Nah, nothing important. Cats overtook dogs as the most popular pet worldwide, I guess. Nothing else, though. Nothing. You mean I'm sick? Because of Sin's toxin, yeah. Anyway, Final Fantasy X. Once upon a time, I probably would have said that Seven was my favorite of the series. These days, post Amora remake, it sort of feels like... It feels like Seven was my high school crush. At the time, she seemed close to perfect in many ways. And now, almost 30 years later, I randomly see her as I drive down the road from time to time. She stumbles out of a mobile home in a trailer park, an opened natural light in one hand, and a blue ribbon tall boy down her pants. In her other arm, she holds a child by the scruff of its waistband. The child is not hers. Yet she's still kind of hot, weirdly. But then, over the hum of the car engine as you wait at the red light, you hear her begin to scream ethnic slurs at a dog, which ignores her. She turns and you see a skid mark on her inside out shorts. She's still pretty good looking though, so there's a lot more going on with it than there used to be, but that's an energy you don't want to bring into your life anymore. And you can't fuck the crazy out of anyone, especially not a Nomura game. Seven became a hot mess because it got involved with the wrong people over 20 years. 20 years of dead cats. But Final Fantasy X did all that right away. Final Fantasy X-2 released just two years after the original. They're sort of like bookends of the same problem. Final Fantasy X-2 and Final Fantasy VII Remake. Not that the problem has ended with Remake. We're just getting new problems. X-2 was blatantly a new, incompetent director's sexual fantasy about the idol industry. It was insincere about being Final Fantasy. It was pop pornography with a parody built around it. It's hard to communicate how weird Tintu was on release. Consider this. The most unsettling thing to come out during this era was probably Spirits Within, which admittedly sank the company, but it was isolated. Advent Children didn't exist, but five was a long time ago. Six was their greatest achievement prior to 3D gaming. Seven was amazing for the time and changed how games were marketed. Eight was the disappointment. And nine was the short step they took to right themselves. So you wouldn't be blamed for thinking that the company had just stumbled a little. The most damning complaint about 10 was mainly that it was linear, and that maybe there were too many cutscenes, which was a general problem with the entire industry at the time. Then you see 10-2 on the shelf. It was very jarring because you could see the intense change in Japan's culture, the consequences of the Square Enix merger brought on by Spirit Within's failure, and the modern focus on marketing to the neat subculture. All on the cover art. Heaven help you if you were in your 20s when you played it for the first time. It's something that, if you were born in the 2000s or even the late 90s, probably doesn't hit you in the same way. But it was pretty fucked up. 
when they announced that the next title in the series would be the company Chasing MMOs, everyone sort of realized that the franchise you knew from the 90s was dead and gone. Final Fantasy X was debatably the end of the series' golden era. Just a couple of years later, X-2 was the start of its Tub Girl phase, where it rained Waffle House consequences upon itself for almost two decades. Oh. Nothing happened in those two decades. Nothing at all. But this video isn't about diarrhea, not yet anyways. Because of Sin's toxin, yeah. Point being, once upon a time, I would have said 7 was my favorite. But I would also tell you that 10 is the... something. The best at being itself? The... most streamlined? It's something. It's unique. Dare I say... special. It's like a woodworker who spent years making chairs, and then staircases, and elaborately carved statues, and then at the end of their career, they make a folding table. It's, it's not a fancy folding table, it's just a solid, useful folding table. The kind you inherit from your great-grandmother after she passes away. Nice table. Looks old-fashioned and smells a little funny. Nice table. And if you look closely at it, you see the craftsmanship. It does look kind of poopy in places, but it's surprisingly nice. Especially considering that the person that made it had an inoperable brain tumor at the time. Final Fantasy X is a weird, nice table. Game. Weird game. The series began as stereotypical fantasy. Seven changed that a lot by turning into... Diesel punk or some other made-up word that still had magical nonsense in it. That persisted until X, which had a post-apocalyptic setting that had magic as its core background element, but still felt as though it was about technology? The world was hyper-religious and anti-technology, but was also obsessed with Blitzball, which is the most technology-reliant fictional sport I have ever seen. It also has a wide array of themes and character arcs and motivations that aren't terribly complex, but do interweave in a coherent, if not mesmerizingly bizarre, fashion. It also had Blitzball. Yes. Blitzball. Trying to comprehensively summarize how strange this setting and story is is a bit like describing a wedding cake as it's stuck in a tornado. It's like trying to solve a math test but the paper is the size of a building and its letters and numbers are spelled with Cheetos. It's like a performative dance by a wacky waving inflatable tube man, but the group of nuns it's performing for are weeping at the most beautiful thing they've ever seen. You could explain it given time, but just do it yourself. You won't get diarrhea. Not, not much of it. You'll just have to play Blitzball. But not much of it. So this is my way of saying, spoiler warning, you should play the game. Or watch an LP, whatever. Go do that. Done? Okay, let's keep going. The game opens with the greatest music track ever performed by a human. To this day, no one can decipher its lyrics because the singer is speaking the language of the gods. What's clear is that you shouldn't give up on it, and another one does indeed await you. Also featured is a mincing idiot man-child with a spray tan. During the late 1990s and early 2000s, everyone had hideous hair. For some reason, every person on the planet dyed their hair blonde with little brown streaks in it. Maybe because a character from the TV show Friends looked like that? I don't know. Point being, Titus had that same sinful hair. Also, in serious tradition fashion, even if his name is Titus, I won't be saying Titus because that sounds fucking stupid. And this poor young man has enough problems to worry about. This world is some sort of vast modern city stylized to meet the criteria to be a Final Fantasy game. A gigantic, ambiguous blob approaches the city, but there are no alarms. No one panics. This apparently is normal? Titus meets your friend's dad, whom he knows already for reasons that aren't explained, and then they fight to get down a highway. Why they fight to reach the dead end of a highway isn't clear because Oran and Titus get sucked up into a sky butthole either way. Couldn't they have just stayed where they were? Well, whatever. That happens first. 
But now I stop. I have words for this cutscene. I remind you about my spoiler warning, because here we fucking go. Okay, this place is Xanarkand. It's the Xanarkand from 1000 years prior to the game. Actually, that's not true. This place is Dream Xanarkand. It's working off the same rules as a summon. Summons in Final Fantasy X work by sort of interring a person in a state of undeath by installing their souls into statues. I don't remember it being explicitly stated. Maybe it was. But this then allows Pyreflies to coalesce into a physical form. This creates things like a bodybuilding sex dragon, or three ladies wearing bug furry costumes, or a tortured and enslaved demon testament to the failings of motherhood, for example. The Xanarkin we see in this opening is technically a fake, summoned version of Xanarkin that is being permanently summoned using the faith bodies of its inhabitants that we see interred into the walls of the ruins of the real Xanarkin. That's the big reveal. Titus isn't a real person. He's some sort of summon. Originally, he was going to turn out to be an unsent, but that changed. Technically, this used to be a totally different game not linked to Final Fantasy about a virus that required the training of healers that ended up being the source of the sickness, but I digress. I have a huge host of confusions about this idea and the history of the world. Bevel is treated as the bad guys and Xanarkin as the good guys. But the source of sin is Yu Yevin, the most powerful summoner ever who was the leader of the nation-state of Xanarkand. The idiotic prequel and tend to go into this, but supposedly everyone used magic until some engineers that would one day be the Al Bed invented Machina. The leaders of the world started using it, including Xanarkand, which makes it look like Xanarkand was the technologically focused city, especially from the opening. But I guess it was actually the magic city, and it only used a little technology. Bavel, who we never really see in this era, was the super technology nation that became corrupt because... science or something. The Vel thought Xanarkin was preparing to attack for god knows what reason, and so they attacked instead. The Machina War happens, which we never saw in 10. At the tail end of this war, Yu Yevin somehow convinces his whole population, or most of it, to get together and create a faith so that they can summon a dream version of their city. Then he also did another plan where he gathered together a ton of pyreflies to make Sin. But I'm not sure what he was using as the faith to summon Sin's body. Maybe nothing? Maybe Xanarkin himself somehow? It's described as armor, so maybe it's not technically a summon, so he's using Sin as the internment statue to possess his own soul. I, I don't know. S so he commands Sin to destroy any city that has a lot of Machina in it. And Yu Yevin's first genius move is to destroy his own city. Later, I think he loses his mind and turns into a floating bug thing. If Yu Yevin could have done this at any time, and nothing can stop Sin, then why didn't he just do that in the first place to end the war? And tell Sin to just destroy Bevel. Then you could skip the entire genocide of your own people. So anyway, before he did this, he told his daughter and the guy that was banging her, to not do the whole Xanarkin thing with everyone else. Instead, they would stay behind and do a suicide pact where the husband would become a summon and she would die defeating the problem her dad created. Also part of his plan, apparently otherwise it wouldn't work, was that his daughter would have such intense regret in life that she would remain to teach everyone to keep doing this as an unsent, which is basically a ghost but it stays sexy. In Oren's case, he gets older and sexier, despite the fact that he died young while looking nothing like he does in the playable game. You think if their whole nation just had enough regrets, then they'd be basically immortal either way. I guess they didn't think of that plan, though. It's also a little weird to me that they installed their faith wall out in the open right next to their city, where a stray bomb or an angry whale could whack off a chunk of it. Put that shit underground, at least throw a tablecloth over it. Maybe Yu Yevin knew one day that summoners from a nation he hated would send pilgrimages of dudes through that one spot, and he wanted them to see it because that's what really does it for him. But th that's another big reveal. Summoners on pilgrimage learn that Yuleska is dressed like a runway clothing theory model, and is actually a ghost person whose dad is wearing Titus's dad 
like a suit of armor, so she can train people to sacrifice their friend to become a summon, so the summoner can die in an ambiguous, unspecified way, that somehow gets rid of Sin long enough for it to reform, which brings about another ambiguous length of time that is probably less than a year. That's called the Calm, where Sin won't attack you while Yu Yevon uses your dead friends to rebuild itself a Sin suit. It's just that simple. It's like Blitzball, but instead of underwater soccer, your best friend must die. A point I like to angrily make at my monitor is that if the Calm is really Sin remaking its armor around Yu Yevon while it goes into hiding because it's vulnerable, then just attack it while it's doing that. It makes it sound like it's a lobster or a spider or a crab molting and it needs to hide so predators won't eat it. So, like, stab it then. That would kill it, right? If it's still immortal, then why would it need sin at all? To just make it easier to crush stuff? And even if it is immortal, then you could probably keep it in a suspended state where it's taking too much damage to reform itself. Despite this thing shaping their planet's whole culture, they never really try anything new. But then again, they're all religious nut jobs at this point. Also, I get the impression Yu Yevon was just excited to try his sin idea and was using the war as an excuse to play around. Also, there were only four calms ever in the past 1,000 years, so maybe they didn't have the experience. It doesn't help that each time someone beats Sin, it's like one guy and a couple of their drinking buddies. But no, it's too hard to fight Sin. Even though the city of Luka is stated to be fine because the Crusaders try real hard to protect Blitzball, I guess it never occurred to Unileska to just set a bomb that will go off a few minutes after she kills herself. Or maybe she wanted Sin to keep repeating forever. Then again, she seemed pretty adamant that Sin was bad and that there was no way to defeat it, so maybe not. Point being, there is a lot going on in the backstory of this game that makes absolutely no sense at all. It's clearly not thought out, and most of it exists to be a big surprising reveal that you're not supposed to look too much into. Most people would throw up their hands and say, well, this game design is meant to craft an experience, not undergo analysis. So like I was saying, where exactly is Dreams Anakin? If it was made right before Sin, you'd think that it would be inside of Sin? Like he made the armor around it and is carrying it around? But that can't be right, if Sin gets blown up sometimes. Plus, Baby Titus would see Sin Sky all the time. But all summons have to physically be somewhere, right? Even if they're considered a dream, there's still a dream of the faith that is somehow linked conveniently to Sin. I looked it up, and supposedly it's out in the middle of the ocean for some reason. Uh, again, I get the impression it was never meant to be anywhere, and the writers realized they were violating their own setting's laws just to be mysterious. I figured it wasn't a real place and was literally a dream, but maybe not. But Sin is linked to it somehow, and you could ride Sin in some unspecified way to reach Dream Xanarkand. Oran does that and brings Titus back with him. This was after Jack did the same thing, although no one brought Jack to Spira, he sort of just shows up after the game describes him leaving to train out on the ocean. I don't know what sort of blitzball training you do in the middle of the Atlantic, but he ended up encountering Sin somehow. If this is going by dream rules, then why would Sin be there in the opening of the game if Sin wasn't invented until after Xanarkin was destroyed? Did Jack reach some sort of map border that he clipped through? If this isn't going by dream rules, then the city is a physical location floating in the middle of nowhere. Does no one living there question why they have no connection to the outside world? Does no one sail further than a kilometer or so off the coast? Speaking of which, do the people there age? Titus grows up, which seems to indicate that they do, but is there some sort of cycle where they reset to some prior point in their city's history? If so, when? Does no one there know what Bevel is? Titus had no knowledge of Machina or Summoning or Bevel, even though that would have been incredibly pertinent knowledge during that era. So, does Dream Xanakin reflect a completely fictional point in history, in which nothing exists besides this one nation and they innocently play Blitzball and shop for overalls all day long? Maybe the cycle ends when Sin attacks, we see it do that in the opening. But Xanakin had already converted to Faith when that happened, and Sin's entire directive was to protect Dream Xanakin. Why did it attack it in the opening at all? Was it because Orin was riding it there? But if Xenarkin is a real physical location, does that mean Orin was literally riding Sen? As in, like, sitting on it and waiting for it to swim past Dream Xenarkin? Then why did it attack, and only at that moment? Does that mean Dream Xenarkin is now also destroyed, but 
to that only happened in Titus's mind. The entire premise of the opening seems to be that it was a historical moment when Sin first appeared, but that's not what happened at all. It really does seem to just be some weird island no one ever noticed out in the middle of nowhere that you can't even visit or find with the airship. So then Titus doesn't actually get pulled 1,000 years into the future at all. What really happens is that there's a fake town doing a stage play of a time in history that never happened, repeating events that never occurred while also aging and having children that are never allowed to events culturally or scientifically, and whose minds are controlled to never question this or to explore too far, so that they can continue living fake lives to honor the memory of a completely unrelated people who are still technically alive and exhausted of inventing this fraudulent performance piece for an audience that does not exist. Yui Evan was a bad leader. This was a bad idea. Also, people like Titus either existed and died during the war, or never existed, and are totally made up people as the dream kept iterating on itself like an open world game that never reset its own scripts. Later in the terrible sequels, we learn that Titus was based off some real guy who sort of looks like him, but is a totally different person. So I guess the people in Dreams Anakin are mishmash versions of different people who have evolved over time, or been combined with other people, or randomized from a template? Did the real version of Titus play Blitzball? If not, why does the fake one? If he did, why were they playing Blitzball during a war that pushed them to extinction? Does that mean there's a mayor somewhere who looks exactly like Yu Yevin, and he has a smoking hot daughter who's filled with future regrets and a disdain for conventional fashion wisdom? Titus remembers unsent people and such, but why would a fake summoned person really become undead from a lifetime of fake regrets? Boy, I have a lot of questions about that. If you can't tell, I love writing them down, but I guess I'll spare you. Point being, there is a lot going on in the backstory that makes absolutely no- Oh wait, I already said that. To summarize, Oran visits an island in the middle of the ocean that no one ever sees that gets attacked by the thing that is protecting it for no reason so he can take Jek's son back with him as a favor to the father so the son can murder his father who is now a gigantic ocean flea that just destroyed his fake town but not really and who was originally summoned by the town's mayor after he had the town kill themselves so they could summon the fake town to impersonate the real town that the ocean flea destroyed for no reason right before it destroys the rest of the planet because the town was using some machines but not as many machines as the other nation that was angry at them for reasons were never told which resulted in the future version of this world being the machine nation but with only some secret machines that use magic and religion to ensure the ocean fleet will never stop making the world worse, even though they're all ancestors of the people that hated it in the first place, but now worship the town's mayor like a god without any of them realizing it, except the new leaders who are all ghosts. Enlightened rule by the dead is preferable to the misguided failures of the living. Or people that hope to one day be ghosts because they're depressed about the hopelessness of a situation that they alone are responsible for continuing. Oren started that. Yes. Man, Oren's so fucking cool. He keeps one eye closed, even though both eyes worked when he was alive. So, you know, he was just doing that to look cool. You sexed up blind asshole. Hold me. This game has some curious holes. I have a curious hole. It's my mouth. So, Titus is teleported somehow, somewhere, finds Waka, and then they decide to play Blitzball. Nothing happens between these two events, don't worry about it. Some dancing lady they run into takes them to this temple, and then they run into the Luka goers. Oh, right. You're that idiot. Don't call him that. But he is an idiot! Okay, pause. What exactly is a goer? Is it one who goes? As in, they are always in the process of leaving? If it was only in text form, I might assume it was some sort of foreign word that I can't pronounce, like gather, or, or maybe it's an alien bird I've never seen, or some manner of large cat. Yeah. Did you know that the Bulldog is the most frequently used sports nickname in Division I college sports? Maybe it could have been Space French for Bulldog, but it isn't. They pronounce it and it's really just GOER! There's not even an apostrophe between the O and the E. That takes some gall. I chalked this up to a Japanese guy not really understanding why this sounds stupid and thinking the word GO had a lot of agency. Wow, a sports team that's always on the move they're the goers! Watch out, fellas! We're going! Or maybe the Japanese guy who did the naming was a secret genius 
who knew how pathetic and embarrassing of a team name this really was, in any language. But not enough that it becomes immediately apparent. Like, they could have been the Luca Thimble penises. It would have described them just as accurately, but it wouldn't have been as subtle. And if there's anything I appreciate in writing, it's subtlety. Our first glimpse of what the Luca Goers has to offer is a single body model with three differently colored skin textures, animation sliding above the crest of a stairwell. Here we meet our first three Luca Goers. From left to right we have Ebis, Bixen, and Grav. I'm not making a joke, these are their actual names that presumably what passed for a mother gave to each of them. I would mention that these names are disturbingly close to Anus, Prixen, and Grabass. But I'm far too classy for that. In terms of color theory, purple and gold usually is meant to indicate royalty. These are their chosen colors. Upon their bosoms, a gold Nike swish swirls around each nipple, bookending the siphon-feeding pucker of some unnamed quivering organ. Above this insignia, there is tied a blue bib, presumably to armor themselves against the possibility of Boom Boom when Baby has his din din. These boys mean business. Looking from your main characters to the comparatively simple models of the Luca Goers with their heavily pixelated, flatly rendered, unemotive expressions, I would not blame you if you found yourself put at ease. It's a bit like staring at a purebred Sharpay for several minutes before quickly looking away towards a heavily pixelated glossy JPEG of actor Jeremy Holm. Ah, you think. Finally, a moment's respite for my wary eyes. There's something calming about their PlayStation 2 exteriors. Abus's perpetually open fly catcher of a mouth goes wonderfully with his tightly wound hair, which itself is nippled like a doll's, neatly into two short, impotent plugs. One for the pink, and certainly another for the stink. Bixen's smug but vacant expression is very fitting for his Chinese knockoff impersonation of Leonardo DiCaprio's cousin. The headband he's worn since middle school is a fantastic way to protect the hair his daddy bought for him. The blue really brings out the skid mark texture that he presumes to be a brow line. And Grav. Oh, sweet, simple Grav. He is truly a blessed union of all the best elements of Ted Healy's legendary stooges. There's nothing about this man's face that I don't love. The intense, focused, and unamused stare the sheer horse-like longness of his skull, that itself is only eclipsed by the intense platter-like flatness of its punched-in expression, all mounted upon what appears to be a gigantic shogi piece. It all comes together in a way that makes his head look like a normal person's face, which is slowly being sucked into itself. He's like the living first frame of a man being transformed into the seldom-used pink butthole of a three-week-old kitten. It's easy to miss all this under the canopy of his truly nightmarish Mo Howard haircut, which fully transforms the mantle of his upper body into the cenotaph of some distant chody penis. An honored testament to the 10 seconds spent in his initial creation. It's a carefully chiseled approach to self-style that says to the world, Thanks, Dad. You made this, and it's going to suck. The three approach Waka totally unprompted. Waka, whose mind is likely preoccupied with some manner of racisms, asks if they're here to pray for victory. This presumably is something all Blitzball players do. Bixen, the largest and most colorful of the three goers, and hence their leader, remarks that they don't need to pray, which might provoke the thought, then why are you here if not to pray at the temple that is made for praying? Waka registers this thought in his own special way. We're here to pray for competition, suggests sweet simple Grav. You just said you weren't praying. Now you're saying you are. I, I don't know what to believe anymore. Bixen then wonders if the Aurochs will do their best again this year. You gonna do your best again? Ha! It's too bad your best isn't good enough. Why even bother showing up? Asking with mean girls levels of derision. You spicy bitch. He's right, of course. Waka doesn't have the heart of a warrior. He talks and he talks, but he has no garamba. He'll never be the champion of underwater handball. His life is basically over already. He's 23 years old and that's too goddamn old to do anything. Why even bother showing up indeed? The other two Luka goers then lick the sides of their hands, presumably as part of some kind of 
cat-like grooming ritual, I'm not sure what they're doing. A strange addition for the scene, but Square Enix knows better than I. Titus, who has been staring through Waka's back this whole time, is pretty insistent that this time, the orcs won't have their pants pulled down for a bare-bottom spanking. This time, they'll try real hard and bring back a statue to their starving, dirt-toiling farming village. And the Luka Goers will have to go home to their billion-dollar estates and supermodel wives with nothing to show for it. Okay, unpause. Later, they get to Luka, right? But no, no, nothing happened. They get to Luka for the actual game. Titus uses the opportunity to publicly ridicule the Goers and laughs at them over a bullhorn while some space popes get off a boat. This deeply embarrasses everyone, but Titus didn't know how right he was. You see, now it's time for Blitzball. With Final Fantasy X packaged around it, of course. This is your introduction to Blitzball, and you're meant to lose. The Aurochs, after all, are the worst team in the league. They have, in fact, not won a game in 23 years. This isn't too surprising. After all, even in real-world sports, professionals have a tendency to emerge from these same general hotspots. This isn't because the people there are genetically predisposed to be great at sports. It's because there's a lot of money in that area whether it's a metropolis or not. This results in things like training camps hosted by actual talent from professional leagues. Parents that are serious about pushing their child into the pros, especially if they're abnormally tall or strong for their age, will move to these areas. The children have not only gifted kids their own age to train against, but are also accustomed to going up against gifted teenagers or even professional athletes. All of this comes together into a sort of Rich get richer situations. Success begets success. The easiest way to become wealthy is to be born wealthy, as they say. Bethesda Island is essentially the ass end of the planet. There's no economy there. There are few people. It's basically as though the town of Possum Trot, Kentucky was made to field an NBA team against the New York Knicks. And the basketball court is a magical water sphere infused with fireflies that only exists in the city of New York and nowhere else on the planet. So you have to pretend that you're playing the sport. Of course they would not win a game for 23 years. How could they? Fortunately for the Aurochs, this year, they recruited a new player. And that new player is some sort of summoned metahuman from a fictional universe where he was programmed to be the son of their Blitzball god. That Blitzball god is now the living concept of sin and it exists as a living entity in the real world. It could annihilate the planet at any moment of its choosing, and its son recently defeated his inner demons and learned the jack shot too while riding a boat powered by a chocobo. Imagine if Bahamut or Anima was summoned into a slam dunk competition. Stand aside, Spudweb. The iron chains of torment need to tear Michael Jordan out from the pits of hell. Does anyone remember who Spud Webb is? Check him out. My brothers and I basically idolized his shortness when we were kids. I credit all dunks I ever made to his greatness. So the game sets you up to fail specifically against the douchebags you ran into from before. It even says your team got a buy in the tournament as a way to make you only have to play one and a half games, just to get you there. Don't ask me how a team with two and a half decades of total failures got a buy in their annual tournament. Waka also wins that game off screen Breaking their 23 years of losses, whatever. Not important. He does get to collapse into Lulu's chest, though. I'm only writing this part down because Lulu's breasts demand that you defy God by dodging lightning for an hour to get her ultimate weapon. If you get struck even once, you have to start over. So that's got to be quite the victory for Waka. Later, he also fathers her children. Lulu becomes so impregnated that they had to make up a stand-in for her in the sequel game. These events probably aren't related, but I thought I would mention it to you. And so arrive the Luka Goers, led by Larry, Moe, and Curly, in the finals. There's actually only six Luka Goers on the whole team, and there are six available positions. I'd say that's pretty cocky to have no substitution available, but the whole game is only two five-minute periods. When I play basketball, I'd sometimes play the entire junior varsity game and then immediately sub into the varsity game and play the entirety of that game as well. Each game is meant to be about 40 minutes, technically, but actually lasts around two or three hours, sometimes four. Even though each round of Blitzball is five minutes, the timer is very fast, so it's more like two and a half minutes in real time. What I'm getting at is that Blitzball may be a sports game for pussies. 
Then again, they are holding their breath the entire time, I think. Or they have gills? Maybe the pyreflies help? But they can also do it in the ocean. And it's always Riku, Waka, and Titus that go underwater and no one else, so... Maybe it's just very easy to hold your breath in this universe, but you need training? I don't know. Point being, the Aurochs are statistically terrible in a game you have never played that only lasts 5 minutes, in which it is difficult to score at all. You also can't control the players unless you're on offense, so if the goers get the ball, it's possible to never get a chance to even play. Titus, your supposed ringer, is also pulled out of the game in the second half to try to ensure that you don't have the tools to win. The game wants you to lose. You can actually feel the universe conspiring against you. The same socio-economic hurdles that have stopped the Aurochs from winning for 20 years are immediately apparent. Even before the game begins, Bixen disrespectfully fakes a handshake before clawing the water in front of you. Dorum, who is apparently not in fact a food stand employee who has fallen into the sphere with us, but is in fact a member of the Goers, to my surprise, pretends to chortle underwater like an idiot. I take this to mean that even though you have not met the other members of the Goers, Dorum, Boldurda, and Roddy, they are also shitty people. They also deserve death. No, it's not just Bloodspall. Death. This is Spira. It's always about death. Yeah! This brings us to my ritual. You see, anytime I play this particular game of Bloodspall, I use all of my ill-gotten knowledge of this cursed game from prior playthroughs. Once you field a better team, you can, in theory, score well over a dozen goals in these five minutes. But we're working with the team that was built to lose. This is a team of untrained rednecks, living in a fourth world village. These simple young men we're working with have stats so low that they don't even qualify for the positions they are best at. Imagine then, the surprise of the city of Luca and its pathetic, arrogant, rich, entitled, spoiled and stinking of fish team of children. When the game begins, I seize the ball. And the first thing I do is swim Titus directly in front of their goal and park myself there in front of four giggling defenders. Intentionally, I break to the strongest one just to show that I can. This jettisons him away from us, like chaff behind a roaring jet. Then I kick the ball, but not at the goal. Instead, it's right into the perfect teeth of one of the mealy-mouthed little darlings. The ball miraculously boomerangs back to me, before I bicycle kick it back into the open mouthed shot face of one of his friends. Before the third even processes what's happening, I punch, not kick, but punch, like a brawl in an alleyway bar at midnight, I punch the ball into his skull, concussing him and causing him to lose treasured childhood memories. All three are now unconscious, or perhaps even dead, likely inhaling water into their lungs. This is somehow not against the rules, not that it matters, to anyone. Only the goalie remains to watch me spin, spinning like a child's top or an errant drop coin. Spinning for no practical reason other than it makes me look like a fool, because that's what's happening. A fool who can barely string together words who grabbed a bullhorn from an employee earlier in the day and screamed to the world that his team of parasite-infected farmers, who had barely ever seen a blitzball, would beat you. A fool. A fool who can't even dress himself with one bright yellow overall pant longer than the other. This fool is spinning impossibly fast in water. The ball has somehow stopped its kinetic motion entirely. All time and space is fixated on this moment. The goalie's eyes locked to me, spinning, super compressing the air and heating it so high that it would kill nearby fish. Again, for no reason other than the goalie knows that you know that the Luka goers are being humiliated. Titus isn't a god of Blitzball. He's the god of shame. Your shame. That thought reaches the mind of Roddy, their goalie. A moment before the ball sails through the water at a speed so high, it singes the skin on his arm, putting the Besaid Aurochs ahead of the Luka Goers, one to zero, seconds into the game. And that's just the first one. 
animations eat up some of the time. But if you really push it, you can score four or maybe five goals before the game tears Titus out of your lineup to try to stop it. The funny thing is, you never even needed him. As a little treat for myself, I like to let Waka score the final goal. Sometimes Letty gets to score too. It's not even hard. Most of the time you waste just swimming towards the corner so the goers will follow you away from the goal. Then you pass it and score. It's just that easy. And the legendary first place Luka goers just can't figure it out. You see, as it turns out, the goers, despite what the game would have you believe, are actually one of the worst teams. They aren't particularly good or bad at anything. They're as mediocre as their character designs. When you get the ability to recruit any player from any team, there's no one from the goers who's even worth recruiting. Sometimes I'll hire on their team leader, Vixen, just to have him sit on the bench for one game. Once considered the best Blitzball player in the world, his stats actually drop off to comparatively nothing. Statistically, he actually ends up being one of the worst players in the league. He never had talent. He only had money. And now his money is mine. The first game will probably end with a score of 4-0 or 6-0, something like that. Did I talk about this too much? Sorry. If there is one thing I hate in the world, it is dick-waving and entitlement. Every time I play Tin, the Luka goers get to enjoy a boiling hot lava dump exploding into their smug Mo Howard-ass trust fund faces. An impoverished, homeless clown child did this to you. I only did it to get Waka a trophy he barely even cares about. Even the camera mostly ignores our towering world champion trophy in favor of focusing on a cute dog. And that dog is happier than you'll ever be again. Get fucked! Maybe the Luka goers should go away. Maybe they should go back to Kilika Temple next year. And instead of praying for competition, beg Yevon for a new micropenis. Somewhere, as they drunkenly contemplate this after the game, they hear Titus uproariously laughing like a diseased crow. Then Yuna, the legendary daughter of the last man to defeat Sin, and the woman Titus is fucking, starts laughing too. Their laughter echoes through the whole city, and it sounds like the whole world is laughing at the Luka goers. Later on, they claim that the thunderous Omega dump I forced them to choke down their throats was a fluke. The Aurochs got lucky, they say, which of course is an invitation to beat their ass 20 more times as they plummet in rankings. Eventually, in any playthrough, they fall to nearly the bottom of the league. Don't worry, guys. There's always next year. Just do your best. Okay, unpause. I'll cover the rest of the story now. Um, later on, you fight Seymour and discover the whole Uleska thing I talked about before. Then you get everyone in the world to sing, even though the human voice only carries about 180 meters. You fight Yu Yevon, who's a bug now, and for some reason you bring all your summons, even though you knew he'd just tried to eat them or something. Yuna cries about it, even though the summons are literally just swarms of fireflies and aren't really there. Not too clear about that. And then Titus evaporates because his faith wakes up or something? And then Yuna learns to use guns and Titus gets revived and kicks a mine that was painted to look like a blitzball and- Whoops, that's too far. Yes, Final Fantasy X is a weird game. I've thought about it for 20 years. 20 years of dead cats. What was the point of this video? Why did I make this? Oh yeah, Square Enix eventually stabilized with Final Fantasy XIV, sort of. Although now they may be making the same mistake by repeating the compilation era by oversaturating the market with ridiculous stories that don't match the tone or intent of the original. Again, maybe. Depends on what idiot they let hold the big pencil. Pretty interesting, huh? I'll get Greg to handle this one so I can get back to animating. I wrote the script in a day so it'll probably be terrible, but Greg can fix anything. You handle it, Greg. So long.